Hi everyone, this is For the Love of Comics and a very warm welcome, getting warmer every day, to the next episode in Single Issues I Love, a video series in which I celebrate my favorite single comics issues of all time by dedicating a separate episode to each of my top 10 single issues. In this series so far, we've covered Grant Morrison's Animal Man number 5, The Coyote Gospel, as well as Astro City issue number half, The Nearness of You by Kurt Busiek and Brent Anderson. Both of those videos can be found Found, along with an introductory video in which I explain a little bit about the wherefores and how I have made this list, uh, parameters I've used, so on and so forth, in this playlist linked above. To that today, we're going to be adding the next single issue I love, Uncle Scrooge number 15, all the way from November 1956, featuring the story The Second Richest Duck, written and drawn by Karl Barks. Now, after I announced at the end of uh, the last episode in this series that this was going to be the next comic that I looked at, I did get some questions from viewers, a couple of which uh, expressed some surprise that I would uh, pick a children's comic, and that too from the 1950s, to accompany what had been uh, modern, heady, intellectual, almost uh, superhero comics. And I kind of understand the puzzlement to a certain extent, because there has been a history of children's comics being sort of flat and boring. I think this is particularly true for the more corporate, branded uh, library of properties like the ones with Disney, like the ones with Warner Brothers, Looney Tunes, Hanna-Barbera, so on and so forth. And I think people are justified in wondering how much quality there can actually be mined in something like this for adult readers in the 21st century. But there are two things I'd like to note, one specific and one more general. The specific one is that this comic is by Karl Barks, the creator of Uncle Scrooge, and Karl Barks was a genius. He was one of the finest storytellers in comics, irrespective of the genre or the audience that he was working for. This has to do with his supreme storytelling skills in characterization, in pacing, in layout, and the way that he plotted for comics, not for animation or for movies or for novels. He understood comics vocabulary terrifically, being an artist and writer, and his stories moved and his characters talked and interacted in a way that very few children's comics, especially at that time, had done. At that time, all of Disney's writers and artists were anonymous, so he wasn't credited for his stories and neither was anyone else. But in anonymity, he developed a reputation as the good duck artist because his stories would stand out from everyone else's by being the good stories. His drawings were better, his pacing was better, and by looking at this story, I think one gets a very clear idea of just what a master Karl Barks was. As for the general point, this has to do with children's comics or maybe even children's literature. It struck me when I was looking at this comic after having done Animal Man and Astro City that as fantastic as those two comics are, they really rely on the reader bringing a lot to the table. In the case of Animal Man number five, it really helps if you know about the Coyote and the Roadrunner and the Looney Tunes and understand the Tom and Jerry violence that is the underlying theme of that story. And for the Astro City story, you don't have to, but it helps if you've got some understanding of crises and reality-altering things that happen in superhero comics. Alongside those, there are other tropes of superheroes as well as comic storytelling that both of them have that even though we don't realize it, we're relying on to fill in a lot of stuff so that those particular comics can do the kind of exploration or the kind of deconstruction that they're interested in. Now, with children's comics and stories, you don't really have that license. You're readership does not have a vast reservoir of references and things that they can uh, rely on to help fill in things. You're not going to be able to create automatic sense of tragedy or automatic sense of comedy because your readers have not yet been trained in understanding punchlines or in understanding uh, relationships in a particular way. This means that when writing for children, you have to develop the entire context right there. You can't rely on having a biblical reference. You can't have something be seen as a Shakespearean thing. You can't have any kind of reference other than to the story itself. You're not even sure what a child does or does not take for granted as having in their world. So every single aspect of the world, its rules and its logic has to be established right there in that work itself, which is tremendously difficult. Now, maybe because of that difficulty, instead of developing and creating a brand new thing from scratch and figuring it all out and how to put it across for a child, it's much easier, I think, for some people just to copy what has come before 
for it and create that sense of uh, assembly line factory made stuff. But there's still the potential in children's work to create brand new worlds and brand new literature without having references to other things in a way that other literature doesn't always have. And this is why I think that even in the 1950s or even before that, like we saw with Windsor McKay in 1901 and 1902, it doesn't matter how long ago, if you had a great creator, if you had a great artist who understood the form and understood what it could do, they would be able to harness it. And that's what I think Albach did. I think he really captured the form and was able to use comics as a medium to do the kind of storytelling that he did so well. I had read once, I think, about Hans Christian Andersen in an introduction to his stories about how he wanted to make sure that a six-year-old could understand his story, so he would cut and cut and cut. He would edit and edit over and over again, removing everything that a six-year-old wouldn't understand. And then what he was left with, I think the introduction called it a writer's dream. It was pure form. There was nothing else. There was no cheating. There was no cliche. There was nothing to hide behind. And that's what Karl Box is to me. He's the Hans Christian Andersen of comics because he's able to distill it down to pure form. And in looking at this story, I hope to highlight a couple of distinct ways that he does it. One is with the art where he uses expressions and shapes and in particular mirroring to do a lot of very complex storytelling. And the second and most important one is how he makes the story purely character driven rather than plot driven. Almost every single thing that happens in this story happens because someone chooses it and they choose it because of the person they are. This focus on telling a children's story through complex art as well as deep characterization gives the second richest duck a completely modern contemporaneous feeling. So that's the theory. Let's take a look at the story itself and see how it's born out. The different parts that Karl Box breaks the story up into start with the beginning in which Uncle Scrooge meets Donald who's on his way downtown to get himself an ice cream soda. Uncle Scrooge is aghast at the idea of Donald wasting his money on such frivolous things and scolds him, telling him that he should instead be investing this money. Donald insists that he is more interested in an ice cream soda. Uncle Scrooge tells Donald that he has never wasted anything in his life. He still owns the first dime he ever earned. It's still tied to him with strings and then takes him on a tour of his giant vault and tells him about everything that he's accumulated. Donald is untouched by all of this, still wanting his ice cream soda, at which point of time um, Scrooge chases him away and then uh, walks off in anger and irritation at this nephew of his who won't um, see sense. So what you have is in just these two pages, the characters of Scrooge and Donald being very firmly established, but the main themes of the story to come also being presented with superb economy. You've got not only Scrooge's thriftiness and insistence that Donald is a spendthrift, but Donald's uh, casual laid-back attitude towards money and being absolutely unfazed by this huge inventory um, that Scrooge presents to him. But we also get a very clear establishment of Scrooge himself. Even if you've never encountered Uncle Scrooge before or know nothing about this character, this is more than enough to quickly catch you up on exactly how rich he is, but also the kind of miserly mentality that he has as far as hoarding and accumulating wealth is concerned. But beyond just establishing these characters, it also gets the ball rolling on the story, which in the second part is accelerated by Scrooge finding a couple of days old newspaper because he won't spring for a new one, which informs him that he is no longer the richest duck in the world. And that title is now held by um, a duck in South Africa called Flintheart Glomgold. This news at first devastates Scrooge, who is absolutely forlorn, but then he decides that he should check his accounts again and rushes to his accountant for a recent audit. He is thrilled to find that he has as much money as this upstart Johnny-come-lately fellow uh, who's been reported about in the newspapers and decides to book a passage on a ship to South Africa and go challenge Flintheart Glomgold for the title of the richest duck in the world. Again, back to back, this is just two pages. So we've had two pages in which Scrooge, his fortune, his relationship with Donald and their differing attitudes has been established established and another two pages to get the ball rolling on the actual central plot, which is Scrooge thinking he's lost his title of the richest duck in the world and going to challenge the contender. Next we see Scrooge, Donald and the three nephews Huey, Dewey and Louie on a ship heading for South Africa. Scrooge has brought with him a full list of all his wealth and the giant ball of string that he has been collecting ever since he was young. Scrooge has asked his family to accompany him 
in case he loses, he'll need them to carry him back home. On the ship, they encounter another string collector whose string they accidentally try to add to Uncle Scrooge's ball. And then they arrive in South Africa and make their way to the Glomgold estate, which seems to be an exact copy of Scrooge McDuck's estate. So the first two pages with Scrooge showing Donald all his wealth in his vault is now mirrored in South Africa, except, you know, with a pound sign instead of the dollar sign standing in. But this is for the readers establishing this fact that this is an equal to Scrooge. Inside, they find that Flint Hut Glomgold is none other than the other string collector on that ship with whom Scrooge has already had an unpleasant run-in. They start comparing notes and find themselves tied in almost every single way. This escalates into physical violence. They have to be separated by Donald and the nephews, and then they're tied up chairs to keep arguing without hurting each other. They keep arguing through the night. Donald and the nephews fall asleep. They wake up the next morning to find that Scrooge and Flint Hut Glomgold are still tied. Every single aspect of their fortune matches exactly. The only thing that could make a difference are their collections of string. So it's a convenient thing that Scrooge has brought his ball of string. They decide that they're going to unroll their respective balls of string across the heart of Africa to see who has the most string and that's going to determine who the richest duck in the world is. Now begins the next part of the story, which is them unrolling these balls of string across Africa. Scrooge obviously has Donald and Huey Dewey and Louie to help him. Flint Hart is all by himself, which makes him fall behind. He's exhausted at the end of the day. Scrooge offers to make him up a cup of coffee and we think everyone's being nice to each other. While Scrooge has actually drugged Flint Hart to keep him from cheating at night, Flint Hart has advised Scrooge to keep his ball of string on an ant hill. So the ants destroy part of the string and in the morning Flint Hart takes off and Scrooge discovers that Flintard has poured syrup on his ball of string and now Scrooge has far less string than Flintard does. But the race continues. Scrooge ignores Flintard's next piece of advice. He's obviously suspicious, but Flintard fools Scrooge again and by now Scrooge's ball of string is far smaller than Flintard's is. However, the next night brings locusts and the next morning there's a grass fire with a stampede, both of which affect Flintard a lot worse than it does affect Scrooge. Scrooge's ball by this time is so small that he can just hide it in his hat. And, and after all these shenanigans, these two gazillionaires are left with two extremely small balls of string which they still proceed to unroll to see who's going to win. At the end, unbelievably, they are still tied, coming in at exactly the same amount of string, which is when Scrooge pulls out of his pocket the very first dime that he had earned and the string that it is tied to him with. Adding this extra piece of string, Scrooge wins. He is the winner of the title of the richest duck in the world and they head back to civilization with the nephews helping carry Flintard Glomgold. So that's the story. In one way, it's an extremely charming, funny story of two millionaires trying to outdo each other and coming down to comparing balls of string. On another level, it's got this whole African savanna journey uh, adventure aspect to it. It's extremely funny. It's got some very good characters work, but the thing that makes this one of my favorite comic stories of all time is the grace and the elegance with which Karl Barks tells this fantastic story. We have no doubt whatsoever that Uncle Scrooge is kind of a ridiculous figure, yet he's our protagonist. I don't know if we want to call him a hero, but he's the guy we're following. He's the guy whose name is on the comic book. From the very beginning with his insistence on investing and saving money and accumulating mass amounts of wealth, we as the reader might more probably be in Donald's shoes where we'd just like an ice cream soda and it would be great to save that money but it would also be great to have that soda. These two ideologies are placed as opposite but what really irritates Scrooge is to find someone who's exactly like him. First is the question of the wealth. That's what sets Scrooge off on this mission to prove that he's the richest duck not this other duck. Then there's the ball of string on the ship where you find another commonality between these two although you don't at that point of know that this is Flint Hut Glomgold. You obviously have the vault and the security and what What's inside it completely mirror what we've seen Scrooge show Donald earlier. And then we get to the personality and the temper and the predilection towards violence, all of which seem to be equally matched. Box creates a lot of symmetry and mirroring in these characters in the way they confront each other or in subsequent panels showing each of them in very similar poses and also in the jokes in the writing like how Scrooge doesn't buy newspapers, he just finds older ones in the park and Flint Hut says, oh yes, I've heard of you, I've read about you in papers that I picked up in the park. 
Park. So there's that kind of similarity. And you also have this mention of Scrooge had told him that he's coming, but he'd sent a telegram and Scrooge never pays for telegrams that he sends and Glomgold never pays for telegrams uh, that he receives. So the message didn't go through, the communication didn't happen. And all of this is very funny because we obviously uh, don't think of either of them as particularly admirable, but we're really laughing at how worked up they're getting about this title and how similar they are. Alongside the comedy of finding a Scrooge doppelganger, you also have the comedy of it all coming down to a ball of string. Irrespective of how much gold or diamond or the mines or the oil and all of these other things that are part of their huge inventory, irrespective of all of those things, it comes down to string and at the end of the day, it comes down to the first piece of string that Scrooge had ever collected, the beginning of his collection, the thing that was tying his first 10 cents to him. So in spite of the whole thing sounding like a competition of wealth, it actually comes down to the most insignificant or the most meaningless things unless it's autobiography. And there are other kinds of readings you can take from it as well, where Scrooge wins because he has family, although his family never really takes his side more than Flint Hutz. Uh, Donald and the nephew seem equally exasperated. Uh, they seem to think these two deserve each other and they're just along for the ride to make sure nobody gets hurt and their sympathies are sort of equally distributed instead of, in spite of the family relationship. All of this is why I think it's quite a modern and contemporary comic. You're not told who to root for, you're not told this is the hero and this is the person who should win, you're not given a lesson, there's no polemic saying that if you behave this way you will be punished or if you do this kind of thing you will be rewarded. Even at the end when Scrooge wins you're happy he won but he could have easily lost because there are many Scrooge stories in which he doesn't come out on top and they're funny and entertaining as well. And that's what makes this such a great example of Karl Barks' storytelling. It's all about the characters. It's about what irritates them and what they care about and what they couldn't care less about. Even at the very end, after all of this, Donald says that he would still prefer a soda. You're not getting a lesson. You're not getting a lecture. You're not getting a moral. What you are getting is a very entertaining story in which all kinds of silly behavior happens in front of you and you can come to your own conclusions about what is admirable, what is not admirable, and what is entertaining. The artwork is top-notch, the dialogue really crackles, and the story just moves from page to page, from part to part. All of these things zip right along, and they connect to each other thematically very well. It's a story about wealth, it's a story about showing off, it's a story about hoarding and having that as a score, and how important it is to have that score uh, be established as what it is. You can see all kinds of commentary in it if you want to, but because you never feel lectured to or you never feel preached at, the story achieves a lightness of touch that most stories don't. And in spite of this lightness of touch, I do think it's an excellent comic that totally deserves to be on the list with Grant Morrison and Kurt Busiek and all the other comics that are going to follow. And that's because we've all read children's comics that are really boring. We've all read children's comics that are quite flat. And we've read children's comics that are well-intentioned. You might even have seen adaptations of works of literature that just sit there on the paper. They don't move. And that's because the people creating them haven't really focused on them being comics. They're thinking about them as novels or thinking about them as plays and the lesson that needs to be taught and the values that need to be imparted instead of the story. And comics have a different vocabulary and you need to understand that vocabulary to tell a good comic story. This story by Karl Barks does not sit still. And not just because of the adventure of it, but because we're constantly seeing characters bounce off of each other. We're, we're very clear about what propels them somewhere. We're very clear what their attitude towards something is. At no point of time do we have any doubt about what someone is thinking. Whether or not we agree with it, whether or not we find it admirable, it's so clear and so unique that it creates distinct characters for us. And that's what allows their performance as fully fleshed out characters to be truly entertaining rather than being that stodgy stick in the mud children's storytelling. Uncle Scrooge number 15 has been one of my favorite comics for a very long time. I read it originally as a young child, but I read it with many other comics that when I revisited later just didn't hold up. Some of them um, for older readers. But this story has, in my opinion, not only held up, but gotten better with time. It works really well for a child because that's what Barks, like Hans Christian Andersen, did. He boiled it down to what the essence of the story is. But as adults, we can appreciate the craft that went into this because there's 
seamless to a child. It just happens as if it's by magic. But as an adult, you can see why. You can see why the care taken as far as character, as far as plotting, as far as dynamism is concerned, had such a fantastic payoff that even decades later, I have no compunction whatsoever against putting this on my personal list of favorite comics of all time. I hope you enjoyed this video. I do want to do more on Karl Barks and his Uncle Scrooge and Donald Duck stories. Maybe I'll attempt that once I have a few more volumes of those Fantagraphics books. I hope you enjoyed this video. Leave me a like to let me know. This has been For the Love of Comics. Thank you as always for watching and I'll see you at the next video.